Beautiful song, huh? Give it up one more time for Zach and Michelle. They're awesome. And by the way, they're going to be the worship for our high school whiteout this year. So that's going to be really exciting, too. Get a little preview. I love it. So this Christmas season, we're in it now, especially after we sang two Christmas songs at church. It's Christmas time. You know what I mean? Like the season is upon us and you either love that or maybe some of you don't like that, but you can't stop it. The Christmas train is rolling and I love it. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you again today um, about that. We're in this Gloria series and it's a really cool idea. I really like it. Um, But I want to give you a little bit of a look behind the curtain of how we do some of the things we do at Canyon View. So when we're deciding, have you ever wondered, like, how do they decide what they're going to teach? You know, like, uh, all, all, every week we have something, you know, pretty much ready for you guys. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> like, how does this happen? Why, what's the process? Well, I'll tell you, we do these creative meetings, and we try to throw ideas out there. And, you know, we're just throwing ideas. And sometimes you clearly have the best idea, and no one agrees with you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not salty about it. I'm not bitter about it. But I felt like we were taking this maybe in a different direction, and I got outvoted. But I'm also starting the series, and I can kind of do whatever I want. So um, I wanted to give you a little look about what we were going to do with this series. So just take your eyes to the screen. Right? Wouldn't that 
have been cool? Manger things? Are you kidding me? You either are like, that is hilarious, and you're laughing because you understand, or you're like, move on, dude. So I'm moving on. Uh, but there is a manger right here, so, you know, partial win. Uh, but this is really, really, really fun to, to talk about the, the birth of Christ, the coming of, of our Savior. And we have to understand why we're doing this. It's not because if you go to church and, and if you, you're, you're familiar with sort of the rhythm of church, you see that every year about this time, we're clearly going to talk about the birth of Jesus, right? We're going to talk about the reason for the season. And it sort of can get into this monotonous pattern where it's just, it is what happens. But what I'm hoping is that we would understand why we're talking about this, why this is worth taking weeks um, in our schedule and teaching on this, why it's worth you being in this room today, sitting here today, hearing from the Word of God about this particular thing. And so I'll just tell you the hope, the goal is, the win would be that it would stir your affection for Jesus, that it would make you fall more into relationship and in love with Jesus and that you would remember why it is that he came to earth. Because we're using these Christmas songs, and each week we're going to be unpacking a Christmas song and saying, like, what is the meaning behind the words of the song? And we did, God rest ye merry gentlemen. And we talked about, they're, they're, we're going to really focus in on this one part, to save us all from Satan's power when we have gone astray. What does that mean and what does that look like? But I would say this, no matter what, what stage of life you're in, no matter where you've come from or where you've been, I think if no matter like where you are as you're sitting here today, when it comes to Christmas and it comes to the holidays, don't you feel like it makes it better when there are little kids around? Like it's just, I mean, maybe you're a parent of young kids and, and maybe, you know, like you're in the thick of it, you're buying presents, you're doing the whole thing. But like whether that's you or whether that's been you or you're around little kids, it's just they capture the wonder of this season in a special way, don't you guys think? It's like it, they just make it so much fun. So we were at the Parade of Lights last night. Now, yeah, okay. I like the Parade of Lights. It was fun. It was not that cold. That was incredible. And so, like, I'm there, and I'm sitting in this chair, our folding chair. You know, we parked, like, you know, 10 miles away, and we urban hiked to uh, downtown Grand Junction. And we're sitting there, and it's starting, and it's like, you know, I'm sitting there kind of just hanging out. And I've seen parades before, believe it or not. And once you've seen a parade, it's like, you've kind of seen a parade. You know what I mean? Like, and it was fun, but then I looked at especially our youngest boy, Matthias, he's five, and he is just waving at every person who walks by. His dimples are showing. He's getting like 30 times more candy than any other kid because he's just so stinking cute. Maybe I'm a little biased, but you know. Um, and he's just like in the zone, you know. He's just loving it. And kids have this special ability to do that. I love how much fun they make things like the Christmas season. And they're really not even self-aware, you know? Like, like he's, just in, he's just waving. He doesn't know. They're not really like, this is not for him. You know, it's like, this is not a Matthias parade. It's just, it's a, it's a whole, there's lots of people here. And sometimes it's adorable how uh, not self-aware they are. And then sometimes my kids are also, because I have a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old, they're also, uh, they, they are Christmas ruiners, okay? <laughs> and what I mean by that is because the 12-year-old, there's such a big gap, he's like already spilled the beans, you know what I mean, about the secret. And if there are kids in here, I, I'm not going to go any further than that, okay? Because I will then be doing what I'm saying they're doing. But so they come and they go, yeah, I told my friend at school. And I'm like, oh, geez, like we're that family. Like no one's going to like us if you guys keep doing this. Like let, let them believe whatever. Like just go with it, you know. And, and it's so funny. But like speaking of kids, what I, have you ever noticed that like the atmosphere in which you, you put the kids into, like it really affects your uh, nerves? I used to be very um, kind of reckless, you know, growing up and just kind of doing whatever, and I wasn't really afraid to do anything. And then I had kids. Have you ever been like on the monument with kids? <laughs> Isn't that terrifying? I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm just so afraid because my kids like walk like this, you know, like 
They like, they're not looking around. Like they could fall off a cliff. I, I know they would if they, if they're, if I'm not like, you know, hovering over them. It's like, they don't, they don't have awareness about danger. They're kind of predisposed. They're like, everything's fine, right? Everything's just going to work out. And that's a really sweet thing. And it's also a really dangerous thing. And so when you think about the Western world, our culture today, in America today, I kind of think we're like those little kids a little bit. Like we don't really understand what Christ came to save us from. We don't really spend a lot of time thinking through what he came to save us from. Because I'll say this, in affluent cultures and communities, and you may feel like, I don't have a lot of money, but comparatively to other places in the world, absolutely we're living in a kind of luxury that most of the world will never, ever know. And when you live in this type of a community where you're insulated from a lot of the suffering that happens throughout the world, you start to think, what's really so bad? Overall, I'm a pretty good guy. What did Christ really come to save me from. And I think that if we don't understand the weight of sin, we could never understand the beauty of Christmas. We could never understand how good it is that a Messiah has come to rescue us if we don't fully understand what we're rescued from. There's a lack of desperation overall in our, our culture to be rescued. And so that is what I would like to talk through today when we think of why Jesus came. We must be reminded that it is to save us from our sin, to save us from ourselves. Would you pray with me? God, we're just so thankful to you, Lord, that you're here. God, I'm thankful for this season that you've given us to enjoy with one another, with our families. Lord, we thank you for providing for us and for protecting us and for being in our midst and for molding us into your image this year. And as this year comes to a close and as we focus on the birth of your son, Jesus, in a different way, maybe for the very first time, our hope and our prayer is, Lord, that you would make this come alive and we would be encapsulated in the wonder of a rescue story. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're in the book of 1 John. I really like the book of 1 John. It's a very small book, and it's written by a guy named, you guessed it, John. And <clears throat> you never know what people are going to think is funny, huh? Like, I didn't think that was funny when it came out, and several of you thought it was, so that's awesome. So we're in the book of 1 John, and our kids, we do this thing called family discipleship sometimes. I would love to say we do it weekly, and it's very all, all consistent all the time. That's not true, but we do it often where we meet with our kids, and we watch something on Right Now Media which is a church, uh, service our church offers. And we learn about God together and we talk with our kids about, um, about Jesus. And it's like leading the most distracted, uninterested small group of all time. So <laughs> it's pretty fun. Though we are going through the book of 1 John and the guy who made Veggie Tales teaches through the book of 1 John in a way that's super cool to understand. And he says, and I believe this to be true, that 1 John is all about what it means to be a Christian. And I think in our world today, it, there's almost nothing that's more important than learning about what distinctively makes us set apart or different from our culture because we're in Western Colorado here. I think the majority of us in this room probably grew up in some type of Christian background. And there's almost, even in America still, it's fleeting in a lot of areas, but it's still very prominent in most of the country that it's presupposed that you and I are Christian just because we're Americans. And so when we think through that, so what, what does it mean then to be a Christian? That actually becomes an extremely important question. 
It's something that we have to talk about, have to teach through. And this church in particular, he's writing to these different churches in a letter, and he's, he's addressing some stuff because this happens, this still happens today, where teachings rise up within parts of Christianity, and they're, they're not what the Bible says. They're taking something from the Bible and kind of tw- just twisting it and making it mean something that it never was intended to mean. And that's a problem because it takes you away from the true meaning of the gospel. And John is addressing these things. There's actually two things specifically that are going on that he's addressing in this particular passage. One is that some people in the church were saying that Christ never actually came to earth. That it was like he wasn't actually, you know, flesh and dwelt among us. So that would make this um, nonsense that we're talking about. And that's actually a pretty big problem in our faith if that didn't happen. And John happens to know from pretty personal experience that that's not true. So he starts to address that. And then there's this other thing, and I think this maybe has a little bit more pull for us today, is they, they were saying that, yeah, Jesus or Christianity is kind of this thing. It's like a buffet, and you can pull and choose things that you like from different religions, but Christianity is actually not going to make a real difference in how you live. That by following Jesus and by listening to the words that he said and trying to live the way that God calls us to live, it's not going to actually change the way that you really live your life. And nothing could be further from the truth. And John's addressing that. And the whole anchor of our time today is going to be based out of 1 John 3, 8. And it says this, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. He just kind of wanted to put it to you lightly right there. (laughs) Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So the reason, what's the reason that he came? Why would a, 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 a holy God... Why would someone who he spoke the world into creation, he's seated up in the heavenly places, being constantly surrounded by praise and worship from everybody up there who's worshiping with him, from the angels. And, and, and he, why would he leave that infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite amount of worship being thrown to him to come and be in flesh and dwell among us to make himself weak like us, to make himself susceptible like us, to make himself vulnerable like us, to experience the hurt and the pain and the grief that comes with humanity in a fallen world. What would compel him to do this? Well, it says really clearly, it's to, it's, it's to destroy the works of the devil. He reveals to us this why. It's to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. Because Jesus, he's coming to make things new again. And we zoom out a little bit. I like 1 John 2 because he tends to, in this book, he makes cyclical arguments, meaning he kind of says the same things. He, he kind of makes the same points over and over again. So you can read it frontwards, and we're actually going to read it backwards today. And he still makes the same point, and it's really cool. So zooming out a little bit, we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 4, and then end where we just ended in verse 8. Sheds a little more light. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Listen to that. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared, was to destroy the work of the devil. So as you kind of zoom back and you see his argument a little bit more, he's saying that sin is a big deal. Sin completely separates us from God. And he says that sin at its core is something called lawlessness. 
And this is a word in the Greek that transforms, or it's translated into anomia, anomia, which means any action void of God's guidance. That kind of puts a little bit more flesh on the bone of what sin is, doesn't it? When it's, a, it's something where you're like, God, you know what? I know that you created everything. I realize that you are set above and, and beyond all things. And yet, I want to live my life. I want to make decisions in a way. I'd like to get up every morning and not consult your guidance and be completely separate. I would like to be the captain of my own life. I would like to determine the direction and the quality of my life. And that is in self is sin. And he calls it lawlessness. So sin is us taking the position of God. And John is saying that this is actually kind of hard to hear. He's saying that habitual sin, where it's like you continually, in certain areas of your life, you continually void yourself of the hearing the guidance of God. You continually push that to the side and go about your own way. He says that habitual sinning is a sign that your heart has not been turned towards Christ. And I realize the weight of that. I realize that that, that that does not feel good. That creates a dissonance even in this room. But I think if we're to be faithful to the word of God, we have to read the word of God and let, let it read us. And that's exactly what he's saying. And so how did Jesus destroy the works of the devil? And really, the, the works of the devil can be traced back to a singular moment when Satan ushered sin into the world. So what's really important that we understand is that there's an overarching story of Scripture. That there's what It's called a meta-narrative. That means many stories that tell one story. So the, all the books of the Bible, they, they all are, they find their place in these four points in the story. The first is creation. And this reveals to us that God is the point of origin of everything that is. Everything that's in existence, it's because God created it and he spoke it into existence. We remember that in Genesis 1, right? And then the second part is the part where we're kind of focusing in on this morning is the fall of man. It's when the, the, the serpent tempted Eve. She ate of the fruit. She gave to Adam. And the relationship between God and man was fractured. Something was broken that day. And we still feel the aftershock of that to this very moment. We see the, 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 the curse of sin and death is all around us. Because of this singular moment when the relationship, when the unity between God and man was broken by betrayal, by sin. And so all throughout the Old Testament, you read about the ways that they try to mask this, the ways that they try to, in their own power, they try to fix this. And there's a king who, he, he rises up and he, he honors God and the nation moves back to God. Then the next king comes and he goes away from God. You see the people trying like they may to fix this and nothing that they do works. Judges says it this way. He says, everyone, wrote, they did what was right in their own eyes. Does that not sound like our world today? They did what was right in their own eyes. And there arose a generation who knew not the ways of the Lord. He's like, this is the thing. When we try to fix it ourselves, we make it much worse. But ever since the time of Abraham, when God said he was going to bring redemption, he's like, you guys broke this and I'm going to fix it. And throughout human history, we see this, this perpetual trying like they might to cover, to mask sin. But Jesus came to destroy the power of sin. And he came to rescue and redeem people and reconcile the relationship between God and man because our sin, it drives a chasm between us and God. And he came to bridge the gap. And we get to live in this period called reconciliation 
The New Testament is in this period, and everything to present day is in this period, where God is making everything new again. He's restoring humanity unto himself, and on the final day, when he returns for his people, he's going to set it all right. We're living in that period, and yet we struggle with this thing called sin. And we must understand who it is that we've offended a holy and perfect God, and he demands righteousness, and we cannot foot the bill. We can't afford it. So as you zoom back a little bit more, what's the remedy? Like, how do we do this? How do we overcome sin when our culture is bent towards lawlessness? The flow of the current of our culture is constantly moving towards lawlessness. How do we then set ourselves apart from sin? And I'm going to start in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and I'm going to read up to verse 3, which is right before where we started the last passage. and says this, And now... Little children, it's the second time he's called us that, right? He's called the reader. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. There's a couple of key elements here. Like that's a, that is a big, big chunk of scripture that is, that is so crucial in the understanding. First of all, we, it, it kind of like, it reinforces our theology of the already and the not yet of the kingdom of God. He's like, Christ has already come and you are already now made children of God. And that is good news. That is what we rejoice. That is what our hope has been founded upon. It's the cornerstone of our hope. He goes, but there's coming this day when he's going to come back again and we're going to know him because we see him as he truly is. We only see in part at this moment. It's really, really cool because Jesus, he's made this way through his sacrifice to save us from our sin. And we have the option for adoption. We get to be in the family of God. He says, little children, he refers to the, the readers that way, to his church that way, because he's saying, guys, we are now made sons and daughters of the living God. We once were dead in our trespasses and now have been made alive in Christ. And it's something that's so extremely beautiful. I love this because he, he goes, so what does Christ likeness look like? We've seen what lawlessness looks like, right? Lawlessness or sin is when we disregard or we void or we live life void of God's guidance. And, and I love this because the term for being righteous or how, how we might become sanctified is another way to say it is not that we would listen and we would do the things that God told us to do. It's actually, he says, if you want to be like him, little children, abide in him. He's like, be with him. Fix your gaze upon Jesus. Fix your eyes upon the Father, the author and the perfecter of your faith. He's saying, if you want to be like him, then look at him. And in a culture where everything is looking away, from God. It's a struggle to look 
and fix our eyes upon Jesus. We are saved from sin. And yet we continue to struggle with sin, don't we? Because it's everywhere. It's the, I mean, it's the very air that we breathe. This lawlessness is everywhere. So this is probably the simplest main point you could ever have for a day like today. But in the middle of this season, it's actually quite profound if you remember the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came on a rescue mission. He came because without his sacrifice, there is no hope for righteousness for you or for me. There is no hope. And we know that because try as we might to fix ourselves, there's this root problem that we can't fix apart from the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And so in our culture today, it's important that we remember that all of the things that the, our culture tries to make Christmas about, those things are secondary or tertiary issues to the fact that we are thankful for the gift of salvation. We are thankful for the gift of rescue. That's the reason why we celebrate. That's the reason why we gather together in homes and we eat together and we have fun things to do. We look at lights. We give gifts because we've been given a gift. And that should be the foundation upon which the believer's hope is built. And that should be where this comes from. It's not like we have trouble looking from a cultural lens about Christmas and commercialism and consumerism kind of run rampant. And they take the holidays by storm and we try to compete and we try to keep up. And before we know it, by the time Christmas Day comes, we can, almost can't wait for it to be over. But that's because we're looking through a cultural lens and not through a kingdom lens. A kingdom lens is that we just say, thank you, God, that you loved us so much that even though our sin has driven us so far away, you made a path back to you. And his name is Jesus. So I think there's a couple of things here is like, if you've heard this before, what's, what's new? What's the point? Well, I think it's because we constantly drift away from that hope. If we're, if we're just kind of floating, we go towards the current of our culture, right? And it's always going to be us swimming upstream to get to the heart of God because not yet has he made this world new completely forever again. And if you haven't heard this hope, I want you to know. I want you to know that there's nothing on earth that you have to do to be in with God. We don't, we don't try to work on righteousness because it says in there, it says that, that we, we, we would purify ourselves as he is pure. We don't do that so that we can be in God's good graces. And I don't know how many years I spent in my life growing up in church where I thought that was the way to the heart of God, that I could behave my way into the heart of God. If you don't, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. You don't have to behave your way into the heart of God. God's already poured out his love and his heart unto you. And for that reason, because he's a good father, we want to be like him so that when he comes, we're not ashamed. We're confident knowing that he's come and it's all going to be new again. And I think there's some in this room too that we have, we have to be honest. Like, are there areas in your life that you continue to sin habitually? And if there are, the living and active word of God says that that's a mark of a heart not turned towards Christ. And cultural Christianity is not going to save you. It's the grace and mercy of God that will save you. And because you're here today, because there's a breath in your body, there's an opportunity to fix your eyes again upon Jesus. Jesus. 
So what would it change if we saw Jesus' whole purpose as a rescue mission? Because the reality is he, love moves first. He came to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made the first move. And he desires to adopt us as his own. So what can we do? Where do we go from here? What can we do to drive ourselves deeper into the heart of Christ and to see the holiday season, the Christmas season, through a kingdom lens instead of through a cultural lens? Well, the first thing, as it says right in the text, abide in Christ. Little children, right? That's us. Abide in Christ. Look at him. Don't look at what our culture says this holiday is supposed to be about. Don't look at what people around us say this is supposed to be about. Look at Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Look at him. Because this is like the thing, this is opposite to our nature. If we look at him, we don't actually have to do anything to make ourselves righteous. He starts to purify us and it just starts to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit as we fix our eyes on him, as we abide in Christ. And the second thing is this, don't let the culture define your pursuit because our pursuit culturally is to give more, to get more, more lights, It's this whole thing where it's like we give because it makes us feel so good, right? And even that's very selfish if you think about it. It's like it makes me feel so good when you get a gift. So who's who's it for? That's the pursuit of culture. And the pursuit of the believer is that we would remember and we would thank God that he came to rescue us. So, Father, as we close today, My prayer is that you would begin to stir people up, that you would begin to spur us on. And that in our culture, as we've drifted, some of us maybe have drifted from this truth. Lord, my prayer is that you would begin to just draw us back to you, that we would fix our eyes upon you because of the love and the grace and the mercy that comes from your sacrifice. It's the reason why we gather. It's the reason why we sing. Father, I pray you would turn hearts towards you. Holy Spirit, come. As we sing this song, it's in response that we sing. It's in response that we worship. So I would just ask that you would stand. With all of this in mind, would you just sing today?